I firmly believe that the NPA is being weaponized. I was woken up at five o'clock, at six o'clock in the morning. Hmm. The police had um, a search warrant. It's an indictment that we've got four ministers looking out the school. I have a view that mm. the NPA was doing somebody a favor. Mm. And I have a view that that somebody is none other than... Spread the fire. Spread the fire. Spread the fire. Spread the fire. Pleasure to be, to be here with you. I have a lot of respect for your show. I've admired it from the distance. I feel privileged to be here and, could, and I greet your listeners too. Thank you so much. We, we, we're very glad to have you as well. And can we go straight to that experience of your case uh, related to uh, procurement around the Kusile power station uh, being struck off the roll after extended and now to be found unreasonable delays? What was your feeling at that time, and what do you think that represents about uh, the allegations that have been leveled against you? I listened to the court and the magistrate when he gave the judgment. And he prefaced his judgment by saying, none of the parties are going to be winners today, hmm. but justice and the rule of law. And. I was woken up at five o'clock, at six o'clock in the morning. Hmm. The police had um, a search warrant, hmm. and in the search warrant say, that was authorized by the magistrate, I read a liner there that says, "We are looking for information. Um, one of the accused, one of the people of interest, has passed on, hmm. and if we get the information, if we get the evidence." Uh, they spent six hours in my house. They, they drove me two hours to Middleburg. Mm. The court proceedings lasted until eight, eight o'clock in the evening. I've never seen that happen. Hmm. They asked for 500,000 bail from me. Mm. Uh, a bunch of white, white old people I guess their age is almost 60, have been taken out of retirement to come and hunt me. Hmm. 12 months later, I still did not know what charges I must answer to. Hmm. This is or was an investigative led arrest, hmm. an investigation led arrest. The investigation that started in 2017 a six-year investigation that led to my arrest. That is, my arrest was preceded by a raid in my house. Mm. And still after 12 months, the NPA could not produce a charge sheet for me to plead the charges. I asked mm. the court, refer the matter to the High Court for pretrial. But before you do that, I need to know what I'm here for. Absolutely. I need to have a statement of fact. And all what the NPA told the court was that we have a 1.4 billion pages and we have 850 statements and 200 witnesses. And they set a trap for me and I did not fall for the trap because they said to the court, we are not ready with the charge sheet. Mm. but we can provide disclosure to Mr. Koko of 1.4 billion, billion pages. And they expected me to be excited to receive this 1.4 billion pages and probably ask for three, four, five years. And in that three, four, five years of perusing this, I paid lawyers 10 cents a page. Mm. Mm. Uh, but when the magistrate gave the judgment, he says, the, the investigating officer tells me that he had a prima facie case to arrest Mr. Koko. I don't believe him. That's the magistrate. Mm. So the magistrate is saying, 
there was no prima facie case uh, reason to arrest me on the day I was arrested. Mm. Now the question is, why was I arrested? Can Can you take us through the the manner of the arrest? Because there are many ways of bringing someone to court, and it doesn't always have to be, um, you know, in one way or the other. Take us through the the manner of the arrest and the way you were brought to court, and uh, whether you think that was appropriate. I, I have no qualms with how I was brought to court. Sure. Uh, the the people that came to arrest me, I I counted about twelve of them. They were respectful. Mm. They, according to me, complied with the order of the court that I read. I have no I have no qualms sure. with that. The, the 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 issue I have is that in his judgment the magistrate says you had no reason to arrest Mr. Koko when you arrested him. Sure. And on top of that you spend in twelve months and you still don't know why you arrested him. So why did you arrest him? I have a view that mm. the NPA was doing somebody a favor. Hmm. And I have a view that that somebody is none other than the president of the republic. Why do you why do you believe that? The the president of the republic dismissed me at ESCOM. I suppose I am the only person in the country ever, and I qualify that because I've not checked, but I think I am, who was dismissed by a resolution of cabinet as an executive of a state-owned company. It's unlawful, it's unconstitutional, and the labor court says so. Indeed, yeah. yeah that was found to be unlawful. Yes. In its wisdom, the cabinet thought, we're going to dismiss him from, we're going to ask the new board of ESCOM mm. that did not even know me, that mm. had not even met, to dismiss Mr. Koko because he's corrupt. Now, that is 2018 January. In fact, that was one of President Ramaphosa's first moves. The first move. Or, or, the first move. And this was supposed to be the first kind of signal yes. of his yes. dealing with state capture. Yes. Now, you don't take a cabinet decision to dismiss unlawfully an executive of a state-owned entity. And six years later, he walks around the streets. Sure. And there is low shedding. The worst low shedding that is cost the, that is cost the country in six months of 2022, 1.6 trillion rands. The, you, you owe the public an, an explanation that this person who did not have load shedding in his time, and you removed him and threw the country into a crisis of load shedding, He's still not arrested, and yet you said he's corrupt. Mm. So I expected to be arrested. Because Kevin has said I'm corrupt. And need I say, I firmly believe that the NPA is being weaponized. And all what they've been doing is to, it's a logical conclusion of what Kevin has said in January 2018. This man is corrupt, and once cabinet resolves this man is corrupt, he must be charged. It's a logical consequences. What what was the NPA? Because um, it was difficult to always follow this, um, or at least the early parts of of what was supposed <coughs> to be a trial. What kind of things were they saying to justify these? extended delays? So, so <laughs> I was arrested. Um, I expected the preliminaries to be done at the regional court and the matter to be referred to the high court for pre-trial in my next appearance, which was six months later. Sure. They came to court six months later and said, um, we have since received 
11 terabyte of information that we received two months before we arrested you. And we need time to look at it. Secondly, we have onboarded a senior counsel from the bar to be the lead prosecutor when we need her to be given the opportunity to go through the mm. evidential material. So it's fine. And six months later, they come back and say, um, we are not done with our investigations. We are waiting for statements from Germany and America. We have problems with mutual legal assistance issues. <clears throat> but guess what? That was the last time I saw the, lead investig the prosecutor from the bar. Throughout the proceedings, he never came. So why did wow. they ask for a postponement to, for a new lead prosecutor from the bar? Mm. And throughout the pre-trial, the, the 342 inquiry, she, she was never there. Mm. Mm. But I can tell you now that um, the reasons for the NPA Oh, yes, here's an interesting one. Mm. The following day after I was arrested, the head of the ID, the director of the ID, Ms. Johnson, mm. did an interview with News 24. Now, News 24 is uh, very close to the MPA. Everything I needed to know about what's happening around me, I would hear first from News 24. Sure. And Ms. Johnson says... We arrest, it is the arrogance of Mr. Coco that created the law enforcement agencies. And he says the arrest of Mr. Coco tells you what the ID can achieve when hmm. it's properly resourced. Hmm. So this was supposed to send a signal, it was supposed to be a PR exercise that would give credibility to the ID, to President, also going back, Ramaphosa. And this, this was about spectacle to some extent. Hopefully, I don't think it was a PR exercise. It, I understood it to be a statement in good faith mm. that says we are properly resourced. Sure. And we've done our investigations and we've got a prima facie reason why Mr. Koko must be arrested. And therefore, we are ready for trial. Yeah. What offended me is when he, when she says, it is the arrogance of Mr. Koko. I mean, that should not mm. affect the prosecutorial decision. Mm. Mm. Prosecutorial decisions should not be influenced by whether I like you or not, or yeah. whether I think you are arrogant or sure. not. Prosecutorial decisions must be based on whether you broke the law or not. Mm. Now, the reason I say this, and I've made it in my affidavit to the court and say, the NPA is coming to court and say, we are not properly resourced. We did not have the right, we only have one investigator on the job. And yet, the following day I was arrested. Ms. Johnson says the, the arrest of Mr. Coco shows you what we can achieve when we are properly resourced. Mm. So it's not a resource issue. Yeah, which one is right? Either they're properly I mean, resourced you and either ready, or... Proper, and I have no doubt, I have no reason to doubt the head of the ID. Sure. Can I ask, just on a personal level as well, because I feel, you know, in the South African news cycle, uh, when, when there are famous people, we we often ride roughshod over what it means to be in the public eye, what it means to be criticized and, and attacked in the public eye. And, and this case that, that was brought, which, which has now been struck off the roll, as I understand it, also affects your family, um, your stepdaughters, your wife. Um, take us through what that has been like in terms of the personal journey and the toll that it has taken you know when you 
become an executive of ESCOM and you are active publicly and you are on social media like I am, inevitably you attract criticism, some good, some bad. So that's sure. normal. Sure. But what I, what I have been subjected to is more than that. I call it a hate crime. I think my family has gone through hell. Mm. And uh, this, the, the first thing that's, you, that happens is SARS on you. Um, uh, uh, SARS has done a lifestyle audit on every single member of my family. Hmm. Um, and there is when the NPA should have known that whatever they're trying to do, they have been set up for failure. Because out of my lifestyle audit and that of my family, mm. I can tell you now, there is nothing that worried me or findings that would later lead to court. But I think that the lifestyle audit and the SARS uh, uh, audit on, my, on me and my family was a precursor to the NPA because they, 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 work, they work together. Sure. You, you saw, you may, if you Google, you'll see SARS demanding 50 million rents from my wife. Um, that matters off the table. Right. Um, okay. Uh, uh, the details of which I can't talk much because okay. the, I saw the statement says the agreements between SARS is between a taxpayer and... Right. And right. SARS. But I can tell you now... You can confirm that matter has been resolved. I can resolved. confirm that matter has been resolved and there was nothing into it. Hmm. Again, it was my family being targeted. Mm. Sure. Placed on the public newspaper mm. that we have a tax liability of 50 million rands that we did not have. The blessing there is because is that we were stripped naked and the information that SARS required from us, all of us, is information that we now that makes us feel confident mm. that we can handle any criminal matter that comes our way. That none of my lifestyle and that of my families were funded through unlawful means. That part, I can confidently tell your viewers and tell you. But it's criminal that I was put through that. Tell us about your bank accounts. I heard something about Bank accounts being None frozen. of my family members have got a bank account. Wow. When I apply for bank, for a new bank and my family, we just get declined. So you can't even have an account? You know, I, uh, and I just don't understand that because I'm, I'm of the view now that access to banking system should be a socioeconomic right. How do you, Absolutely, yeah. how do you function? How do you work? How do you get paid? Mm. So I must come to you and say, I'm going to do work for you. You must pay me in cash. Nobody's sure. going to do that. Mm. Mm. Because immediately what comes to you is money laundering. Mm. But this is a coordinated attack on my family by the state. Law enforcement agencies, and the banking system all working together to liquidate my family for the crimes that we did not commit. I have no doubt that anyone who commits crime, anyone who loots state coffers, must be held accountable, must appear before the court, and must, be, must face the wrath of the court. But I consistently said that, that person will not be me or any of my families. There is a confession and admissions by ABB in America. Yes. Now, this is the company that got the contract at Kusile, which is, is the, the subject company of the that case. Got company that's, this is a corruptor. It's sure. always a corrupt and a corruptee. Now, if the corruptor confesses and make admissions and pays six billion rands fine in America, 
equivalent of six billion rand per in America, mm. and come to South Africa, and signs an a, 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 an agreement with the NPA, which uh, I argue is unlawful, and I'll deal with that later, mm. and pay a total of ten billion rand admission of fine. Hmm. Then you must have a slam dunk case. Mm. And yet, the NPA hasn't been you able. You must to have a slam dunk case. Here's a, it's, it's a confession. The the corrupter is admitted to paying ten billion rands. So what's holding you? So can I can I also ask you because of course there's there's the ABB uh, which is a contractor which was related to the Gusile power station, and and the allegation that has been made in in media publications is that. They subcontracted a company which was related to your stepdaughters, I believe. My daughter. I your, don't have oh, stepdaughters. Your, sure, sure, your I, daughter. I, I have, you know, it's, 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 it's people who, who are mean, who refers to my daughters as stepdaughters. Sure. And, I have and no stepdaughters in my house. Absolutely. And in our culture in general, there's no such thing as a yes. stepdaughter anyway. So your daughter having benefited from being a subcontractor are you are you confident that and the and the procurement decisions that were taken throughout that process are you confident that you did not engage in any corrupt activity any fraud or money laundering or racketeering um, as relates to that entire process you know we went to the labor court on the same matter sure the Labour Court judge, I think his, I remember his name as Judge Moshwana, said to ESCOM, you had allegations of conflict of interest against Mr. Cook. You charged him. You put him through the tribunal. Sure. And he was vindicated. So what's your problem? So what's the problem of South Africans? How many times and how many occasions must I go through a tribunal on one allegation. The NPA is trying to have a second bite at it and they will fail. The allegations of conflict of interest against companies that my daughter was a director of, I answered them in a tribunal. I can confidently tell you that that was the first case in ESCOM that was on public television. Mm. When the media applied to be in that tr uh, hearing, yeah, that disciplinary process, yes, yeah, my lawyers opposed it. Mm. They wrote the opposing papers without talking to me. Mm. When mm. they came to me to sign that debit, and I said to them, "What is this?" They said, "We're going to oppose the media from coming." I said, "What for?" Mm. Because this is an opportunity for me to be tried in public when all South Africans are watching. Mm. That ESCOM must lead the evidence. I must defend myself in public. Not only the, the, not only must there be a judgment by the independent panel, but the public must go through mm. the mm. evidence, and they have done that, and I was vindicated. And to your credit, and not only mm. that, but Eskom was also ordered to pay my cost. Hmm. Okay, I wasn't aware of that, and and I was just going to say to your credit. You appeared at the State Capture Commission. Yeah. You appeared in public, uh, in Parliament. Yes. You appeared in public with the ESCOM disciplinary. You've gone to court. Yes. You've appeared in court and you've said, I'm, I'm, I'm prepared to defend my case. So yes. at, at no point have you attempted to dodge or delay accountability in at least these four different processes. You know, when I was arrested, I think it was Avril Mtila who... who interviewed me, I was in the dock, and I said, there will be no Stalingrad. This matter must start and it must end. When the state asked for postponement, I said, no. Mm. I want this matter referred to High Court for yep. pretrial. I don't want the delay because I'm ready to answer the allegations. The allegations against me are very serious. Mm. And, and, and I keep on saying South Africans are being taken for a ride. You can't Put allegations that the NPA is putting mm. against me and not be ready for trial. 
once you put such allegations, justice cuts both ways. Justice is not for the accused. The NPA is the lawyer of the public, is the lawyers for the community, they represent communities. Communities expect justice. Communities expect people who have looted their coffers to answer to the questions that they must answer in court. So it, 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 it's, an, it's an indictment to put across such allegations. And six years after investigation and 12 months later after an arrest, you are not able to proceed to hold Mr. Koko accountable to answer those questions. Absolutely, not even able to clear the first hurdle, let yes. alone the, the high bar of, yes. of beyond reasonable doubt that would be applicable. Yes. Now, let me also get to the NPA sure. agreement with ABB. Yes, yeah, I wanted to come there you anyway. Know, uh, ABB confesses to a crime, mm. serious crime, mm. crimes that have got minimum sentence. They enter into an agreement with NPA yeah. that indemnifies them from prosecution. That's unlawful. Without the order of the court. The NPA oversteps its authority, overreaches, and say to the corruptor, just pay me the money and deliver Mr. Koko, because my target is Mr. Koko. Mm. This is the prosecution. This is a prosecutor that must prosecute without fear, favor of prosecutors, entering into a deal with the devil mm. to get to that target. And we haven't heard about ABB in, in, as, in as much detail. They haven't been criticized in the public space. There's no ABB must fall campaign. It's, it's, it, it, it speaks to the extent to which we hold commercial interests accountable in our country versus individuals who get inflated into these symbols of, of corruption. But that agreement I will challenge. And I've mm. lodged a complaint with the public protector. Okay. Uh, it is within the scope of the public protector. He's mm. given me 10 days to come. He said to me, give me 10 days. Okay. I will come back to you to tell you if I will investigate it or not. If mm. it doesn't, mm. I have no doubt I'll take legal advice and we'll mm. go to court. NPA, uh, 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 ABB mm. must appear in court. Mm. It must plead. They've already accepted guilt. If they want to pay fine, they must do that in court. It must be a plea and settlement agreement in court. They must have a criminal record that can be protected. What's also interesting is that they also have another uh, uh, agreement with ESCOM and the SIU, where they paid ESCOM 1.6. The agreement between ESCOM, ABB, and the SIU said it will be an order of court mm. and it will be set, set aside. It has not been to court. It's not been set aside in court. Mm. It's not an order of court. And the reason for that is because there is no way that ESCOM and ABB will go to court and say to court, this is how Mr. Koko misconducted himself. ESCOM processes, you can fault ESCOM for anything. You know, if you, if you say, you know, I ex let me tell you what, what I expect. Mm. They say, you manipulated the process, the procurement process in ESCOM mm. to favor ABB. Right. So I expect the evidence to go like this. This is the meeting. This is what you did. Mm. This is an email. Sure. This is a WhatsApp. This is the people involved. Mm. These are the statements of the people involved. You are a puppet master. They were the puppet. Mm. They were taking instructions from you, and they say so. There's nothing. There's absolutely nothing that ESCOM can put on the table and say, as a minimum, Mr. Coco did not comply to this procedure. This is an unlawful instructions he gave, and he did both of that to favor ABB. There's no such. And I am not surprised why they are still looking. What is happening is people that are non-ESCOM that says, I mean, there's, there's a two or four state witness. Right. He says, I don't know Mr. Koko. 
I have never met him. All what I know is what I had on the streets. I can't vouch for it. And the two or four witnesses, that's someone who the state brings who was who who says they have information about the case, but the state kind of turns them to give evidence against you. Yes. Th- and that, that's fine. Sure, you know, sure. That's fine. If yeah. you if you if you if you are a partner in crime and you want to tell in return for indemnity, that's fine. Sure, sure. By ABB. Hmm. Now he's going to go to court. He's going to go into that box, and I put it to him that you are paid to write this hmm. statement. Hmm. So there's the state capture commission as well, which I'd like to come on to um, before we also get onto questions of load shedding and ESCOM's policy and, and your perspective on that. Because what what strikes me about the State Capture Commission, which made adverse findings against you, which you're challenging, which I also want to to go into, is what they didn't say. (coughs) And two things come to mind. Firstly, in fact, the Skusile case, which was the subject of the case that got struck off the roll, if you go to the State Capture Report, you don't find much mention of, of it. So I think people in their minds have connected the State Capture Commission and, and your appearance in court when actually they seem to be rather separate processes. But also you made some comments about President Ramaphosa's involvement in, um, <coughs> was it Optimum? Um, that didn't feature much in, in Judge Zondo's um, understanding of what state capture in ESCOM was. Can, can you talk to, to those two things that, that are <coughs> actually not in the State Capture Commission report, at, at least in as much detail as other, other questions, which have been covered ad nauseum, um, and why you think those, those questions are not mentioned? Jabu Mabuza made the submission about ABB. The Zonu Commission looked at them made no findings. That on its own should tell you something because Zondo had better investigators sure. and a better legal team yeah, yeah. than what I see happening at the NPA. That it's being referred to as a state capture case. It's something that I don't understand. But remember, there were 202 recommendations from Zondo for the (coughs) state owned, for other agencies to investigate, including regulatory authorities like IRBA. Right. Twelve of them were were on Osco. There are no arrests on any of them. Mm. And I put it to you that there will be no arrests on Osco that are state capture related. (coughs) My name is mentioned 500 times. I'm taking the matter for review. Yeah. And it's, it's exciting. (laughs) <laughs> it's going to be a very big embarrassment that no one gets arrested at ESCOM for state capture related crimes mm. and that is why I think the ABB matter has been crafted as a state capture matter mm. when it went to state capture 
commission and there were no findings. <clears throat> the state capture commission part of ESCOM was a farce, was choreographed. But you know, my father always tell me that things happen for a reason. And with time, people will look back and say, but what was it all about on ESCOM? More so, when you consider that the time that Chief Justice Zondo considers as a peak of state capture at ESCOM mm. is the time that had the best performance all round. If you look at the time data series, you've got symmetry. Operationally, the best performance since 2001. No load shedding. The diesel ban was, less, was a load factor of less than one. We're sitting at 6% now. I banned 10 million, my team banned 10 million liters of diesel in 12 months in 2017. Today they're banning 50 million liters of diesel in a month. I spent, my team spent in 2017 335 million rands of diesel in the whole year. Today they're spending 3 billion rands of diesel in the month. So the peak of state capture. The peak of state capture, you spend 800,000 rands a month on diesel. At the peak of state capture, today you are spending 3 billion rands. At the peak of state capture, you did not load shed. Today you are sitting, as we speak now, between stage 2 and stage 3, which 2022 being the worst of load shed. Of, of, we never made a loss. <coughs> Listen to this. We generated cash from the operation at the peak of state capture of 1 billion rands a week. That's 52 billion rands a year. Today, they're generating 800 million rands. That's 42 million rands a year. Cash out of operations. So state capture must have been good for ESCOM. So maybe ESCOM needs more of state capture. You, you, you see the problem. I, I see the point you're making, and, and I think one of the interesting narratives that has emerged over time as new leadership came into ESCOM, but that leadership has now left, is that load shedding has been a, what is it, a 15-year virtually uninterrupted process. But when you look at the record of load shedding, um, that's not necessarily true. There were times when South Africa actually hasn't been in load shedding since 2008. It's very opportunistic to say we had load shedding for 15 years. It is not supported by the factual evidence. The first load shedding we had was in, in, in October, 27, to, October 2007. And, and that was the consequences of the policy missteps that happened in the Abumbegi era, which he apologized about. Sure, sure. So we can confidently say that the policy mistakes that Tabombegi era made that was remedied when Alec Owen came in, and I was, that was part of it, mm. led us to the load shedding of, 20, of 2007. Right. The reserve margin was at that time 2%. There was no load shedding in 2009. There was no load shedding in 2010. There was no load shedding in 2011. There was no load shedding in 2012. Load shedding came in 2014. And it came in 2014 for a specific reason. Because we lost the Majuba coal silo that supplied coal. We the, the, the 400 ton coal silo that collapsed at Majuba, if you Google it, you'll see it. It happened on the 2nd of December 2013. It was on a Friday. It was on a, on a, it was on a Friday. 
and also because on Sunday, or the following day, we flew with Minister Brown to Majuba. Mm. We lost 3,000 uh, 3, megawatts. Hmm. That's why we had low shedding. Right. It took us eight months to reconstruct that silo. And we finished reconstructing that silo, uh, rebuilding that silo in August of 2016. Look at what's happening in the media. You'll see that the, the time frame, 2016, 2017, they want to eliminate it from history. You know, it's like the, the hunter writing the story of a lion and, and eliminating certain parts in history or in the behavior of a, of a lion. So you won't see much today about what happened at ESCOM in 2016. You won't see much today about what happened in ESCOM 2017. Because once you do that, you're going to be confronted with the reality that there was no load shedding in 2016. There was, for three uninterrupted years, three years, from August 2015, there was no load shedding. In 2015, we were very bullish. January of 2017, we, uh, we had uh, uh, six we had 5,600 megawatts of surplus capacity. Google it, you'll find it. I gave a press statement on that. I said, we have 5,600 of surplus capacity. We must increase our sales by 8% in three years. But we took a long-term view and said, in 2021, 2022, the, the economy will grow. We, uh, the systems will be tight. Um, but we must not do shit. So we took decisions and we said, I took a decision to the board with Brian Mulefe mm. that the old stations that were due to be decommissioned, their lifespan must be extended to 2030. Right. Because we expected that the systems will be tied. Uh, Brian Mulefe used to say to me, I have one job. I'm not here for long. My job is to keep the lights on. Mm. And you say, I'm not an engineer, you're an engineer. And I said, if that's your mandate, that's my mandate. We understood. And I've been in ESCOM for over 20 years. Yeah, sure. And when you grow in ESCOM, <clears throat> you understand that load shedding is like death. You don't want it under your watch. And I always had an opinion, even when we're not doing well as a young engineer, mm. that I can do things better. And when I was given that opportunity by Brian, I told him that if we don't, if we load shed, you must fire me. Mm. That's how bullish I was. When Brian came to ESCOM, I was, I was on suspension. Uh, and when I came back from suspension, uh, Brian had conceived had a, a maintenance model. Quite inter I found it very interesting because he was an engineer, he called it Tetris. Tetris. <coughs> I modified it, mm. but he, he, it is his invention. I don't want to take credit from him. Mm. But I said, we must have a maintenance budget. In summer, the maintenance budget must be 11,500 megawatts. Unplanned maintenance and planned maintenance, 11,500 megawatts. In winter, our maintenance budget must be 8,500 megawatts. Sure, because of the higher winter demand. Because of the higher winter demand. We must live within that maintenance budget without burning diesel hmm. and must keep the lights on. That's why we are engineers. That's our claim to fame. That's the operational engineering that we must provide to the maintenance team and to the operating team. 
we must be able to see around the corners. We are engineers. Mm. So we, we were successful. Uh, we took a decision to extend the life of the power stations. But we also acknowledged that the age of the ESCOM fleet at that time was 35 years, and 35 years is relatively old. Sure. But it also comes out of the back of the 2010 World Cup, and we still had the consequences of the policy mistakes that we're talking about, mm. where we did not have a reserve margin, where we, had, we ran the plan much harder. And at that time, we had what we call a reliability objective. And our reliability objective at the time was we call what we call 97.3. Uh, 90% availability, 7% unavailability, 3% breakdowns. That's how we managed since 2001. We sure. said, for the age of our plant, we have to change. We change it to 80-10-10. 80% availability, 10% unavailability, 10% plan maintenance. So we said, we have a maintenance budget. Our liability objective now is 80, 10, 10. Live within this budget, within this reliability maintenance. Don't load shed, don't bend diesel, make a profit. That's why you are there. We considered ourselves the supplier of the last resort. And that was so up until 2006, when we had when we had electricity regulation act number four but even beyond that we asked ourselves a question that it, the state has got plans and by the way um, in escom we've always known that the state is incompetent in the business we're in you know on average an executive of escom where we operated would be would have had 30 years of ex ESCOM experience mm. from down up. <clears throat> sure. Now you have these politicians who, with a lot of ego, with a lot of power, mm. not engineers, have no clue, but they've got the power mm. and they want you to feel it. Mm. So we manage them, we keep them out of the kitchen. <laughs> but we always say to ourselves, those opinionated people with power, when they fail, we are the supplier mm. of the last resort. We, they will come to us. And we pushed back. You know, for example, we walked out of the war room in September 2015. Hmm. We took, if you look at the ESCOM board resolutions, yeah. the board took a resolution of ESCOM and says, we will no longer participate in the ESCOM war room. It's distracting us. We are forced to report to people who don't mm. know much. You are forced to write paper after paper every week. You mm. are either in Pretoria or in Cape Town mm. when you should be on the plant. And I recommended to Brian, I said, Brian, I'm not going there anymore. Mm. Brian recommended to the board, the board took a resolution that ESCOM will no longer participate in the war room. Mm. I think that upset Cyril very much. I was going to say, was, was that maybe something that, that created that division between you and the president at the time. That, that upsets well, But it's the right president. thing to do. My job sure. was to keep the lights on. Mm. I had to make a choice. Mm. What would... Do you think it's possible, it's possible to get out of this load shedding crisis, the deepest that we've ever been, everyone has to acknowledge that. Do you think it's possible to get out of this crisis in, in a reasonable time? Let's I, say one or two years. I was excited when Numsa approached me mm. to go to court to write a technical paper for them so that the court can declare load shedding unconstitutional. Mm. Which it just has done. Which we were successful. Mm. Mm. So you wrote uh, the, the technical... I wrote the technical submissions for that. Mm. The reason I did that is because I don't think South Africans deserve load shedding. I don't think South Africans deserve load shedding. Um, in, this, in, 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 in as much that I was there and I solved it, it's solvable. So this is what we do. This is what we do. Um, and I'm going to speak a lot of technical jargon, but sure. I'm sure your listeners follow you. Mm. The power stations 
have got what we call a balance of plant and the power island. Okay. The balance of plant supports the power island. Right. They've got redundancies. One thing that I've made sure that must happen today is that all the standby plants must be available. In your car, your standby plant is your wheel, it's a spare wheel. Right. Your right. spare wheel must always be available. If, if your one of the wheels breaks, you put a spare wheel there and you must have the spanners and everything to, to put the spare wheel there. Mm. You don't need a plant maintenance to have your balance of plant available. That's a maintenance you do with the plant on load. That's why we've got redundancies. So your, your ash plant, your coal plant, your water treatment plant, your demineralization plant, your uh, cooling water pumps, your extraction plant, the standby plants there must be available and it will be wrong and an indictment if they're not available. And if I was at ESCOM, the manager who has a plant that is spare, that is not available, I'll fire him. Mm. I will not negotiate with him. So at present, is that right. being, is that, are those plants part of the planned maintenance cycle and taken offline? Is that part of the... I'm saying they should not be part of the planned maintenance right. cycle. Right. Because you can, you can, you maintain them on load. You don't need to right. take the plant off. So while they're working, they should be maintained. Basically. Yes. You have no excuse. Sure. So when I read about the reasons for load shedding mm. and, and it's, it's, it's a coal plant, mm. it's an ash plant, Mm. It's a water treatment plant. Mm. It's a CW plant. It's the extraction plant. Mm. It hurts me. It really, sure. really hurts me. Those are things that should never be tolerated. Mm. And if you've got competent people and competent leaders, that has to be, that has to be done right. Mm. I was trained in Germany. I was trained in the U.S. for boiler tube leak prevention. That's mm. my claim to fame. I was mm. a corporate specialist at ESCOM for boiler tube prevention. Mm. The performance of materials under high temperature and pressure. Boiler tube failures are preventable. And this is what's caused this most recent stage This is six. what caused what most. So when I sit back mm. and I hear ESCOM leadership trying to justify to the public mm. that low tube, boiler tube leaks are inevitable, mm. it hurts me. Boiler tube leaks are preventable. That's so interesting because we just hear right. these technical boiler tube yes. leak. Oh, well. And they tell you about coal and this. Mm. Boiler tube leaks is simple. Mm. It is the repeat failures that are throwing you under the cliff. Mm. The repeat failures, they happen because you, get, you don't eliminate the root cause. You have to fix the root cause to permanently remove the problem. Fly ash erosion is typically the biggest because you've got, uh, it's related to coal, but it's not the ash in it. It's the bulk velocities in the ash. It's the peak velocities that you go and look for them. Erosion is a, is a, is, 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 is a cube of your, of your velocity. You measure velocity, you double your velocity, you increase your erosion by eight. Okay, now... No, um, that's a jargon. No, that's, that's fine, the, the, but, the, the, but I really wanna, want to understand it. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so, when we say mm. summer, yeah, the heat temperatures are causing major breakdowns. You know, I've listened to many expect mm. uh, waffling, mm. <laughs> but this is the reason why high ambient temperatures are a problem. Mm. Mm. The higher the temperature, the higher your partial pressures. PV equals to NRT, the engineers will relate to that. The higher your pressure pressures means the higher bulk velocities in your boilers. Right. The higher your bulk velocities in your boilers means higher erosion rate. I said erosion is a cube of your, of your bulk velocity. So when it's hot mm. and your bulk velocities go up, 
you keep, you take your velocity in mm. the boiler, which is typically 12 meters per second. Sure. That's how we design it. I'm a boiler designer. I'm a boiler mm. process designer. Mm. That's how mm. we do it. And it so, goes up. And it goes up. It increases your, if, if, you, if your velocity doubles, your erosion sure. is increased by three. So. And that's why the leaks. You, you, you erosion you're erosion is more likely. Yes. Yeah, so sure. you have, you have to look for these velocities. Mm. Mm. You have to mm. look for them. Now I see. And and, now I and, see. and there is um, w there's two interventions to it. Mm. One is that where you've got high peak velocities, you reduce the velocities. You put what you call a diffusion screen. You diffuse sure. your velocities. You sure. drop your velocities. Mm. Where you can diffuse them and drop them, you divert them. You put a diversion screen. Sure. And sure. then you put sacrificial material so that you can measure the wear millimeters per year, mm. 0.5 millimeters per year, mm. so that you can then decide how long you run these boilers. your power plant around your cycle chemistry. You get your chemistry wrong, you're going to have corrosion failures. You're going to have corrosion fatigue failures. Then you've got uh, uh, temperature-related failures, long-term overheating failures, creep failures. You know, you see the granularity I mm, go to. Mm, mm. It, 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 it's, it's not a Chris Yellant story or, <laughs> or, 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 you know... Sure, sure, yeah. one, of, one of the analysts. Yes, we, we, yes, yeah. yes. And, and the... The biggest impact on temperatures is not at, at air conditioning, air cool conditioning of Kosele or air, mm. cool, air cool conditioning of um, uh, Matimba or, or Midupi. Mm. It's not. The, in fact, you, you, the air cool condition, the, air, the, the mid, uh, Matimba, Midupi mm. is perfectly designed. In your air cool conditions, we've designed it properly percent so you anybody who says to you midupi is not performing because of higher ambient temperatures you must write him off just walk away from him because we've learned from matimba we've made big mistake in matimba mm. and we've corrected them at midupi kosele will not underperform because of the high amb ambient temperature again we've learned from midupi mm. the the water cooled power stations, Krill, uh, Majuba, one, Majuba 456, five, four, five, Duva, Tutuka, high ambient temperatures, the cooling tower efficiency is poor, the, the, what we call the back end temperature, uh, the, the back pressures is a problem, w uh, water cooled power stations. So, so it's not sure. the fence that, you know, I read about Chris mm. a lot and I realize we have gone to the dock to realize such type of explanations. <laughs> but that's what you do. You, you become totally fixed. You know, I see the passion in this room. That's your job. Mm. I, I watch it. Mm. I see how you come across. I see this person. It's, it's all about passion. Sure. It's all about technical passion. Mm. Mm. So, Absolutely. So, 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 Boiler triplex can be prevented. Then you've got another part called TRIPS, automatic separation from the grid. That talks to the command and control structures. Right. The, it talks about the discipline. Now, the, in a power plant, you build a culture, a culture of disciplined execution over a long period of time. But you collapse it overnight. And my submission is that the, that discipline culture of execution that was the ESCOM way, you know, we, we call mm. it the ESCOM way. We, when we go to conferences overseas at ESCOM, mm. we'll sit back uh, uh, with people and we'll go see, says, you see, that does not work for ESCOM. Mm. And remember, by that time, ESCOM was a top global utility. Yeah. We were working on water. By the way, the manager of the year, when ESCOM was a top performing power station, it's me. Now think about it. And people don't think about that. Mm. 
I was the manager of the year in 2001. And I was still a young boy when ESCOM was voted the top mm. utility of the year. It shows you my influence. That was the year I was appointed a corporate specialist for, for boiler tube leak prevention. Mm. And the biggest impact we did then under Brian Dames was to reduce the tube leaks. Mm. Mm. The command and control structures at ESCOM sure. are showing in the performance of, of the unit trips. So is this basically when, when people have to communicate that there won't be power going from one place to another and there's, there's a miscommunication somehow between the different um, infrastructures? Think about the pilot. Mm. Think about the captain. Sure, sure. When I engage my team, mm. technical team, says, you are the captain of this pilot. Yeah. Boeing, um, Airbus, 600 people in there. Mm. When you take off, you must learn with these 600 people. When you take off, when the Airbus take off from OR Tambo mm. and it ends up in Charles de Gaulle, it must land. Mm. You don't want funny things. Yeah. And it's not by chance that the Airbus takes off mm. and it lands. And the captain behaves in a particular way sure. that is sure. predicted. Mm. Mm. And communicates in a particular and way. And communicates in a particular way. Ground control, the co pilots. Exactly. Mm. It's choreographed. <clears throat> sure. There's no difference with the power station. Sure. This is a masterclass on, uh, on how, to, how to really end load shedding. Yeah. There's, no, there's no difference. I mean, mm. take Kubek. Mm. Kubek can. You know, one of the things we did in 2015, at the peak of station, uh, at the peak of what Zondo, Chief Justice Zondo says is, mm. the, is the peak of state capture. Mm. We got Kubek to achieve the best World Association of Nuclear Operators rating of two. That was the highest rating and the best rating the country ESCOM ever got under my watch in February 2017. We did that because we said the, uh, 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 the security of electricity supply lies in nuclear. The rest supports nuclear. Sure. Therefore, we have to be a very competent nuclear power plant operator mm. so that, that globally mm. we can be trusted with future new, sure, new world power yeah, stations. Yeah. If Kubek gets it wrong, think of Chernobyl, mm. think of Three Miles Island. You can't get it wrong. These are engineering machines. It's like your car. Mm. It behaves in a particular way, in a predictable way. It comes with a document that sits in your cable. You've got a telemetric data there that tells you you've got 2,000 kilome 2, kilometers to your next service station. Mm. When you take it to the, ne to the service station, you, you do it upfront. Some, these days, they even send you a WhatsApp sure. that we think your car has done 50,000, it must come in. When you take it in, the 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 the, me the mechanic already knows what he's going to do to your car. He's already got spares and everything, and he tells you, bring it in in the morning, come fetch it out in the afternoon. When you take it in the afternoon, you want to get home. You don't want to take it out of the garage, and then before you go to the rev to the robot, you've got a red light. Mm. You're gonna throw your toys. I looked at the data yesterday, mm. preparing for today. Sure. The units that are taken out of plant performance that gets fixed, mm. that must come out of the garage after being fixed and performed. Sure. ESCOM has a target that the breakdowns must be 14%. Mm. 
it's it's a very poor target. Sure. The target should be less than 10%. Sure. But the actual performance mm. is 35%. So when we are putting these units to fix them, when we're taking the car to the mechanic, yeah. when it comes out of it's the mechanic, worse. it's still breaking down it's worse. 35%. Yeah. So, so so why did yeah. you do it? Why yeah. did why you did take you it there? Fix? Because when you're fixing it, it also wasn't yes. giving you any... So any... what are you doing? Now, this <sighs> is in the ESCOM annual results. Mm. The power stations that are taken for plan maintenance, mm. when they come out in 60, month, in 60 days, yeah. the breakdowns are 35%. So what are we doing wrong in the maintenance, do you think? Maintenance... You see, think about your car. You've got condition monitoring on your car. You've got the equipment in your car that monitors mm. the conditions. Of sure, your car. sure. So you have to have a very good understanding of the conditions of your car, stroke mm. the conditions of your power station. Mm. Mm. That's operations engineering. We call it system engineering. Sure. Sure. Your system engineering must understand the conditions of the plant. Mm, mm. So you must get those right. early signals that yes. something if could be wrong. If you don't understand the condition of the power... You know, Formula One is a, is a very nice example. Mm. You've got telemetry data. You've got the race engineer that sits in there, sure. that monitors the condition of the car, mm. that takes, that tells the driver, you must pit now. Mm. Mm. Because your tires are worn, you must pit now. Yeah. So the condition monitoring, mm. I can tell you now, mm. is, is, is not what it's supposed to be. Hmm. But the, the importance of condition monitoring, of critical equipments, not all equipments, right. they are equipments that you should never allow to fail under your watch. Hmm. That's what we call critical equipments. Hmm. When a critical equipment fails, or by definition, a, a, a critical equipment is that equipment that we when it fails, it either kills people or damages the environment mm. or you've got capability loss. So this is an equipment that you can't allow to fail mm. under your watch. This is an equipment when the Airbus take off. Sure. You are rest assured. You see that equipment, it mm. will never it will land in Child mm. Those equipments you must understand the condition of the plant. And there are tools that help you to understand the condition of those plants. Once you understand the condition of the plant and you know that it's time to, to take this equipment to a pit stop mm. for repair, mm. then you must know what to do. You must have the space. Sure. And then you must have the artisans mm. Mm. to do the job properly. Yeah, yeah. You don't want comebacks. You don't want oil sure. leaks. Sure. You know, you take your car in for service. Mm. You park it in your driveway. You wake up tomorrow morning. You come out. There's oil there. Mm. You don't want that. Then when it comes in, it it must do the performance that it's set to do. That's what we call mm. operational discipline, engineering yeah. discipline. You don't pick it overnight. You grow with it. Mm. You grow with it over 20, 30 years. And the leader on top must know it because that's what you drive it. This is how it works. You know, my dad used to say, my child, this is, in this house, this is how things work. If you don't do things this way, then go put your own shack. Mm. But in this house, this is how we maintain power stations. Mm. In this house, this is how we operate power stations. Mm. In this house, this is how we pro provide operating support for these power stations. Mm. Load shedding is unconstitutional. We don't deserve it. And it's fixable. And it's fixable. Hmm. That's, that's amazing. I've, I've never heard uh, you know, such an in-depth analysis of, of the problem. Um, in terms of the political management, because of course, as, as someone who's been right at the top of ESCOM and seen what it's like operationally, but also politically, what do you think of the move to appoint a minister of electricity? And what do you think, uh, Dr. Uh, Ramo, what do you think of Dr. Ramahopa's tenure and whether 
he has made the kind of decisions that will help to get us out of this crisis? It's an, it's, it's politically, it's an indictment that we've got four ministers looking after ESCO. Minister of sure. Finance, Minister of Public Enterprises, Minister of Energy, and Minister of Electricity. Hmm. It's an indictment. It says you have failed to lead. I think that's the first part. Sure. I don't know Minister Ramakopo. Hmm. I know him from far. Yeah, yeah. Um, very energ energetic. Um, mm. Comes across a person of detail. Yeah. Um, personally, I think he'll make the right, the best chairman of ESCO. Hmm. Personally. Hmm. And the reason for that is because the. He, I think he applies himself extremely well, mm. but he's also got the political cloud because you need that. Mm. Mm. The best chairman I worked for was Dr. Nguban. Right. Dr. Nguban was the best chairman. Um, and the reason for that is because um, politically he was respected by his peers. Mm. Mm. Um, he would, you would sit with him and say, <clears throat> let me give an example. Mm. President, Ram, President Zuma made a statement in the State of the Nation address in 2017. And he said, ESCOM is going to sign the independent power producers. And they put a date, 11th of April 2017. Yeah. And I refused to sign. Hmm. I refused. To sign. Uh, we went to meet the president. And Dr. Ngubani was very clear. The executives have briefed us. We understand it. We will not sign them, and we support them. Hmm. We ended up in Cape Town in, in a subcommittee of cabinet. He did not budge. It's the right thing to do. Hmm. What the executives are telling us is that if we see, uh, this is going to, in 2016 alone, dispatching renewables cost ESCOM 16 billion, 16 billion rands. And I asked Dr. Ngubani, if you want me to sign this thing, I will sign it, but you must give me upfront in writing how you're going to fund it. Mm. And if any politicians tell you to sign it, he must give you upfront how you're going to fund it. ESCOM today has got this year 23.9 billion operating loss net. It's projecting 23 billion rents next year. It's low shilling. What's the point? What is it you're driving? We should be driving. This is what we should be driving. Keeping the lights on. At, co at all cost. It's not negotiable. It's unconstitutional. Sure. You can't break the law. Yeah, and that's no, that's the point. It's it's, it's so, so devastating the nation. Keep the lights on. At the price that people can afford. Sure. Be on a decarbonizing path at the pace and scale. Sure. That we can afford. And no, no one's saying decarbonization shouldn't happen. No. That it's that it's wrong. It's a, it's about the timing. Yes. Given the crisis yes. of load shedding. Yes. We, you know, I used to say to the cabinet, mm. we commit to decarbonizing. Sure, we sure. will decarbonize. Yeah, and it's an important imperative yes. in the long term. But we will not do that at the expense of keeping the lights on. And we will not do that mm. at the expense of affordability. Mm. You know, it, it saddens me that you probably have solar rooftops on your rooftops. Sad, sadly not. Sadly not. I'm sure you will. But uh, I, I aspire to that. I'm, indeed. Sure, I'm, I'm, sure, <laughs> I'm sure you do. You will. You yeah, will. yeah. But it saddens but me. this building has a generator yes. where we film it. It saddens me that um, a combination of load shedding plus the price of electricity mm. is forcing this building and the people in Sentin yeah. to have solar rooftops. Absolutely. On that, on, 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 on uh, solar mm. panels on their rooftops. The people in Alexander, mm. the people who can't afford. Absolutely. They can't afford. So, so 
what is happening now is that the price of electricity, yeah. because of the path we've selected, mm. is going up the roof. Mm. So you are deepening energy poverty. Yeah, and you have less energy yeah. while it's becoming more expensive. Yeah. So 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 you know when I once I went to about two months ago went back to my home and I, I was mm. born and bought in Soweto. Right. You see people going back to paraf to to paraffin. Mm. Sure. People going back to coal stoves mm. because they just can't afford it. Mm. So you you really don't want to decarbonize at the expense of load shedding mm. and forcing people through the tariff yeah. to go back to kerosene and uh, coal. Mm. It's wrong. Mm. Mm. If I was in charge, the line of march would be simple. Mm. My priority is to keep the lights on. And I can't keep the lights on through wind and solar, by the way. Mm. You can't. Support the grid. Sure. Commit to options that will keep the grid. Mm. The people who grew up in ESCOM will tell you that power plant, power plant planning spends 20, 30 to 40 years. That's how we grew up in ESCOM. Mm. We sat in ESCOM and we were planning minimum. In, in, in 1997, 1998, we mm. said we will run out of capacity in 2007. Mm. Mm. And people will say, but why do you think about 2007? Yeah. Why? It's too far. Mm. Mm. That's how far we're planning. And on that year, we ran out. And it, mm. it, it, it happened that mm. way. Mm. We sit, the engineers, power plant planners should be sitting today mm and say, in 2050, there will be mm. lights on. Mm. We need to make options today to keep the lights on. Mm. The, gross, the gross capital formation in 2016 between Transnet and ESCOM was around 70%. Once you stop the ESCOM build program, you stop the capital investment at Transnet, mm. the capital fixed commission just collapses. Mm. There's no growth. The economy grows at the back of infrastructure development. The biggest infrastructure development is power plant operations, is, trans, is, 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 is Transnet mm. water infrastructure, which we're not investing in. Mm. Mm. So the state must commit to a path of continuously building the backbone of the grid. Sure. Then those who have money can build solar panels mm, mm. In, their, in, 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 in their leisure. Sure. Now, the key, the key consumers of electricity, the mines, we've, we've got uh, what we call emergency level one and emergency level two. I can put it to you now mm. that in as much as they talk about wind and solar, they will, that is meant to provide for 20% of their load. Now, that's a very important part. Mm. They will provide for 20% of their load. 80% of their load must come from the grid. Mm. Mm. The grid is ESCO. You must build that grid. So the numbers from the key consumers look and sound big. Mm. But it's nothing else but 20% of their load. Sure. 80% of their load must come from the grid. Minister Ramkhopa should sit back and say, this 80%, this is how I'm going to supply mm. it. Mm. Let alone uh, uh, new concepts that make sense uh, 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 that ESCOM is, 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 is coming with uh, uh, synchronous generators, 11 of them, yes, mm. but you need to build a grid. Mm. Can I ask what you think about the the overall trajectory towards the privatization of ESCOM and whether you think it's possible to, to have a state-owned uh, power utility that is functional uh, or whether you, you think that the trajectory of privatization and unbundling is, is wise? Excuse me. Um, in my view, South Africa needs to commit to a pump storage 
scheme today that will be in operation in 2035. It needs to commit to a nuclear plant today that will be operational in 2035. We're talking on easily 100 billion, 200 billion that, sure. that will pay back in eight years. Mm. It, mm. Private sector don't play in that space. Mm. Mm. It's a massive risk to take if you don't have that kind of guarantee yes. from the state. Yes. yes. These are natural state mm. monopolies. It, so, so I don't see private sector building synchronous generators. I don't see private sector building a pump storage scheme. I don't see a private sector building nuclear. Mm. It's got to be built by the state. It's got to be built by the state, and, and, and we must stop procrastinating. After all, even the private invest, and it's not about money. The reason it's not about money is because what makes the independent power producers what they are in South Africa is contingent liabilities from the state. The state backs up all the power purchase agreement for the independent power producer so that the IPP can go and raise financing. Right. So, so if the independent power producer can go and raise the money, then a state-owned company can go and raise the money. So it's not about the money. Sure. It's, 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 it's ideological. The ESCOM sales volumes, sales volumes are declining by, on average, 2.5 percent a year, year on year. Hmm. So the volumes of ESCOM to this year, hmm. and this year is 2024, in 2024 will be less than 2023. Sure. So if the ESCOM sales volume continue to decline at 20 at 2.5 percent, then there will be no ESCOM in 10 years' time. I hmm. mean, that's how it is. Hmm. So it's not whether it will be privatized or not. Hmm. It's whether it will actually even exist or not. It, will, it is whether it will actually exist or not. Mm. And, and this is why I say the ANC government, when it comes to energy sector, is incompetent. Mm. It's incompetent. Here is a utility that's got 52,000 megawatts nominal capacity. Its sales volumes are declining mm. by 2.5%. <clears throat> I made an example earlier that in our time, in 2016-17, we generated cash from operations in a week of a billion rands. Sure. Today, it's 800 million rands. Mm. So you can see the writing is on the wall. Mm. This is what is called a death spiral. This ESCOM is dying. Well, you know, whether privatization is irrelevant. Mm. Mm. How do you save this guy? Because this is the guy who should supply 80% mm. of the loads in the mines mm. into the future. That must be what's preoccupying us. It's not an antithesis of renewables. Mm. It's not either or. We do both. But remember, renewables are not the grid and they cannot be the grid. Mm. You need the grid. The renewables support the grid. The renewables are not a problem. We just fail to plan for them and then they become a problem. Just in terms of governance as well, ESCOM hasn't had a CEO for, I don't even know how long at this point. Um, 12 months. 12 months. There have been promises that it would happen, I think, in March and June, in September. We keep getting promises, but we have these load shedding crises and there's no CEO at the wheel of, of, of the company. Um, I mean, how concerned should we be at, at the lack of an appointment of, of a CEO? And do you know any reason why we haven't got one yet? I don't know the reasons other mm. than what I read on the newspapers. Mm. <clears throat> the president said we'll have a new CEO yeah. in, in Dubai. Praveen said we'll have one in December. Mm. <coughs> I think it's said that it took 12 months. Mm. Uh, Rome is burning. Absolutely. <coughs> Rome Absolutely. is burning. It's, it's, it's said. Yeah, yeah. But then again, 
Do we need to? Do we need one? <coughs> do we need one? Uh, Minister, I'm hope I see you there. That's basically what's happening. Mm. Performing better than other CEOs. Like yeah. as well. <laughs> yes. So, uh, I think properly placed Minister Amkhopa can do a better job. Mm. Mm. And they should just let the governance structure work with him basically at the helm. Hmm. I want to end by just coming back to, to one thing that you mentioned in terms of the, the legal cases. And this is your challenge to the state capture report itself, which you alluded to. Because in addition to the Skusile case, there's also you taking uh, Judge Zondo's findings on review. And there again, there have been startling delays in, in this it, it, process. It, it took 12 months to get the record. So you asked for the record and, and you just didn't get it for, for a year? Yeah. I mean, take, take us through what kind of delays have come through from the side of the State Capture Commission. I heard just... They just don't yeah. respond. There's just yeah. no response. <laughs> you go, you go. There's just no response. Sure. I received the records because I was... I instructed my lawyers to 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 submit a, an application to compare. Mm. This one I received them, hmm. and they're twenty two thousand pages. Sure. And when when do you see that that review application happening and coming to to a, a conclusion in its in its I substance? I will submit my supplementary uh, affidavit pursuant to the record this Friday hmm. and, there, and the ball is on their court hmm. um, I think it's going to require a lot of push from my side hmm. to get traction I think Zon, uh, Chief Justice Zondo did not anticipate that he will be taken for review hmm. I don't think he's got interest in it hmm. Well, we, we await that case as well and we'll be watching very closely in terms of that review. Um, but Mr. Koko, just, just to thank you for sharing your perspective, sharing your experiences, your side of the story. Um, certainly when it comes to the corruption case, we've heard the other side ad nauseum, um, but it's been fascinating to, to hear your side and your perspective. And then also on load shedding, just sharing your expertise with us um, in, in a way that's been deeper than I've heard anywhere else before. And um, we hope that our country can still uh, benefit from that expertise. And um, just thank you for joining us on SMWX. Thank you. This is one of the first occasions when I had to tell my story and yeah. I really appreciate it. I said at the beginning that I have a lot of respect for you. Um, I, I was nervous, <laughs> and uh, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks to your team as well. We appreciate it. Maybe we'll have to have part two one of these days. Most certainly. Most certainly. Thank you. Aye, aye. <laughs>